five. I think planet normal. I think we may actually be having to really consider moving to a different solar system with this level of lunacy. Four. I'm starting to wonder if our politicians, as we've said in the past, are addicted to lockdown. I'm sorry because I do think that we could unlock now, and we should unlock now. If Boris didn't let her wedding go ahead, I would walk naked down Whitehall with a flamethrower. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Sir Boris has fluffed it. There we were, all set for Freedom Day on the 21st of June, a final lifting of anti-Covid restrictions. Yet that's now been pushed to the 19th of July. Michael Gove then weighed in, saying even that later date might not mark the end of this ghastly lockdown. No matter that the UK's outperformed the government's so-called roadmap on almost every metric, vaccine take-up and effectiveness, and the still incredibly low number of hospitalizations and fatalities linked to COVID. We're still being asked to stage weddings without dancing, hugging, and with tables limited to six. And our schools and huge hospitality and leisure industry remain badly disrupted for a second summer running. Yes, COVID cases are rising, not least of the so-called Delta variant. But we're now doing 10 times more COVID tests each day than we were back in May. How often do you hear that on television? COVID's a nasty virus co-pilot. And of course, some people are still scared, not least because the government keeps staring at them with statistics presented that are woefully out of context. Will lockdown ever end, Alison Pearson? Are we to be socially distanced forever? I'm hoping to meet you, co-pilot, at some point, you know, <laughs> for, a so- for a socially distanced hug. I've actually uh, had quite a lot of listeners this week who were who were actually very very worried that I might have spontaneously combusted on Monday <laughs> during the absurd press briefing. But how could we tell Halligan whether I have you know whether I am in a, a billion pieces of dispersed ire through the universe? I mean, I think Planet Normal. I think we may actually having to really consider moving to a different solar system with this level of lunacy. Oh, look, what did I say last week? Had a bit of confidence. Boris was kept saying there's nothing in the data to suggest that 21st of June needs to be delayed. You fell for him again, didn't you? Honestly, I mean, how many women have fallen for that man? He's like a bad boyfriend. Keeps letting you down. Totally terrible boyfriend. And as, as, and as you said in the intro, you know, the COVID deaths and hospitalizations are well below Sage's best case scenarios when the exit roadmap was drawn up. And the British people have done the absolute damnedest. We've passed the four tests with flying colours. We couldn't possibly have done better than the best case scenario. And then we had this, I don't know what you thought about it, Liam. I could hardly watch it, that press briefing. The three men on the behind the podiums, they quite rightly looked uncomfortable, shifty. Shifty is the word. I would use. We had the Prime Minister. I don't know if he's badly briefed or if he's just, you know, improvising. How is it you put it in your column for an articulate man? He didn't half say, uh, a lot. Oh, I mean, I think you can tell when he's deeply uncomfortable. He knew he, I'm sure at some level, he knows he's letting people down. And this, I mean, I could not believe what I was hearing, Liam. He's actually saying, you know, if we don't get all these extra people vaccinated, you know, the hospitals could be overwhelmed. And we are talking about saving thousands of lives. There isn't another word for it. I hesitate to say this. It's just a lie. It's just not true. Now, you know, we've always, I'm not going to go into too much, George, this week. Planet Normal listeners will know we're very, very blessed in having a a source deep inside NHS England. And we can't independently verify what George sends us because the data that they provide 
is so fresh. Liam, I set George the task, having watched Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance giving one of their hilarious comedy slideshows to prove how dire the extremely encouraging and positive situation is. I set George the task of reviewing what they were doing, right? So on the claim by Professor Chris Whitty that hospital admissions have risen by 50%. George says... They have clearly cherry-picked and used point-to-point data, which is really bad statistical practice. They must have used Friday's data, which reported 77 admissions in the 24 hours to 8am on the 10th of June. If you compare that to the number of admissions reported seven days prior to that, it was 52 on the 3rd of June. So in one week, we did go from 52 COVID hospital admissions to 77 the next week, which is a 48% increase, even of very small numbers, which they could legitimately round up to 50%. But it's smoke and mirrors, because if you compare the discharges, Liam, on those two days, they far outweigh the hospital admissions. On the 10th of June, there were 144 COVID patients discharged. Yes, COVID patients get better discharge compared to 77 admissions. And on the 3rd of June, there were 90 COVID patients discharged compared to just 52 admissions. Oh, says George, and they are using admissions only for this analysis as far as I can work out. If you compare the confirmed number of patients in hospitals between those two dates when Witty and Valance and the Prime Minister claimed that there was a 50% increase, the number was 905 compared to 779, and that is just a 16% increase. And George says 16% of a small number is a very small number. What do you think, Halligan? The data, the cherry picking of data, data mining, we call it in the world of statistics and financial markets, is completely blatant. And it's not just that old trick that you've highlighted on Planet Normal before of looking at hospital admissions, uh, gross hospital admissions, not net hospital admissions, including discharges. They also, in announcing this delay of Freedom Day, use their old trick of of drawing graphs with the horizontal axis only covering certain dates. So the percentage increases is look much bigger, not comparing it to previous waves of COVID that we've had. Uh, and on top of that, of course, we've seen no emphasis at all on tests. As I said at the outset, we're now testing six, seven, eight hundred thousand people a day. Whereas back in May, it was more like 60,000 a day. Yeah. <laughs> so there's been a tenfold increase in the number of tests. And if you up the test by, you know, 10 times, you're going to get a lot more cases. And of course, again, many of these are lateral flow tests, which are highly unreliable. And you get just fragments of a virus in your system, which do no harm whatsoever and is completely normal. So it is layer upon layer upon layer of statistical obfuscation and I would say smoke screening in order to justify this case. And I really am starting to wonder if our politicians, as we've said in the past, are addicted to lockdown, addicted to the power that it gives them. And I don't say that lightly. I'm talking about some people I've known for a very long time, personally, as you have. You don't do what we do the way we do it without really getting to know the politicians we write about and talk about. And I am wondering about some proper sort of personality disorders going on now. I can't put it more politely than that. At the very least, there is, I'm not saying people aren't under enormous pressure, they are, but at the very least, I think there is a a chronic reluctance among our political class at the highest level to say to the scientists, look, it's your job to focus only on the worst case scenario of what could happen under this ongoing pandemic, uh, if you can even call it that anymore. It's our job to consider everything across the board, the costs of lockdown, the impact on mental health, the impact on young people, the impact of what could be yet another year 
of completely disrupted schooling, not least for my children at both university and secondary school. So I'm shaking with fury as well at this. Planet Normal, we keep it light. We have fun. We want to be a ray of sunshine. We want to give people hope. But we are both hopping mad (laughs) today uh, when recording this because I think we both feel that there's a lack of courage and statecraft leading us out of this situation. Of course, there is risk in life, but leadership is about a balance of risks and engendering courage so we can go forward, not spreading fear, not hiding your head in the sand, not just shying away from a difficult decision because you're worried it might go wrong. Did you see him? Um, my favourite phrase of the week, Liam, which I found, which I thought, oh, Liam will love this, was you've heard the phrase evidence-based politics. <laughs> well, somebody on Twitter said politics-based evidence. Yeah. Now, isn't that perfect? That is absolutely That's perfect. what we were seeing on Monday. We were seeing a case, statistics used to trump up a decision that had been made before, which was nothing, nothing to do with the actual facts where we have almost all the vulnerable population now, you know, totally vaccinated. And this week, Liam, we've seen New York has opened up completely. California has opened up completely. There was a Hungary-Poland match, stadiums full of, absolutely packed stadium full of people, not wearing masks, not social distancing. So as I said in my column, I think that the UK is looking like a hysterical outlier. It's absolutely embarrassing. And Theresa May, not someone I ever thought I'd want to see return to Downing Street, but um, absolute heroine this week, stood up in the comments. She's been spot on. She's been, she's played an absolute blinder since she's really good at being a former prime minister, isn't (laughs) she? She is, she is. And she said, how can we be among the most vaccinated nations in the world, yet not give the people back the freedoms which, you know, which those vaccines deserve. Now, it's something that struck me, Liam, was that you've had a few people. It's a kind of like, oh, it's only four more weeks. You know, it's only nightclubs closed. It's only one politician, Labour politician, was on the radio and described it as a minor inconvenience. I don't think people understand what's going on here. So as you said, the, the children... The kids, they're still in these crazy bubbles at school. They're still being sent home because, you know, one person in year seven coughed. We're still seeing these huge disruptions to education. But it's more than that, Liam. The end of term, the concerts, the sports days, the sweetness in life, that those kids, this is the second summer, they're not going to go on. The rights of passage. These are. This is why everyone goes to work and creates wealth. So... You know, people can have yeah. these kind of experiences. When does this end? Absolutely. And another thing, which I think from our lovely Dr. Claire in London wrote uh, to Planet this Normal. This is one of our anonymous GPs who Planet Normal has been in touch with over the last year. And Dr. Claire said, people don't understand. They're not going to be able to see their GP in person until the social distancing measures are lifted because the practice managers say, oh, we can only have two people in the waiting room. So this minor inconvenience, so-called, of another four weeks is more people not seeing their GP face to face, more people not being able to live the rich, full life. I got vaccinated, Liam. You got vaccinated. I'm doubly vaccinated. I didn't do it for me. I did it to reassure older people so my children could have the lovely life in their early 20s that that they thoroughly deserve. And uh, you mentioned earlier, it's quite funny, readers of my column will know that my lovely friend Catherine, who's getting married, who twice postponed wedding now, supposed to be getting married on July the 10th. And I promised Catherine that if Boris didn't let her wedding go ahead, I would walk naked down Whitehall with a flamethrower. <clears throat> this has got quite a lot this has got quite a lot of followers now. This. A flamethrower aimed where? <laughs> At whom? Should Matthew <laughs> Hancock be passing? I wouldn't mind uh, you, you can't know can't be held my- responsible for your actions. <laughs> 
I can't be held responsible for a sexual. We're abuse. joking, of course, listeners. We're joking, <laughs> but she's really angry. We're joking, of course. What's the text message that Dominic Cummings has um, just revealed from Boris, saying that um, <laughs> the latest dom bomb, the latest that Mr. Hancock was, I think, effing useless. I thought I thought that was polite, actually. If the prime minister's just anyway, that that's by the by. But just coming back quickly, so you love this. So the wedding rules, because Boris obviously realised that being mugged by fifty thousand brides wasn't going to be a really good look. That's the number of people who are trying to get married. He used to dream about things like that. He used anymore. to dream. Not anymore. No, not anymore. <laughs> He's been through that phase. He has been through that phase. <laughs> so they've lifted the 30-person cap, Liam, on the wedding. So you can have a big wedding. But the rules are, I mean, it, it is like having Oliver Cromwell as your wedding planner. All right. So it's no singing. No dancing. You're going to love this one. No mingling. No mingling. <laughs> and apparently speech is allowed. Speeches are allowed, but only if they're shouted in from outside. So you can imagine the father of the bride outside the window going, you know. It'd be like Zippy and George on Rainbow, you know, shouting through the window to Jeffrey and Bungle inside. Are we now, as we said before, you indicated last week you thought we'd start seeing some kind of soft civil disobedience. And I think it's going to bubble up. But I suggested to Dan Wooten on GB News that we should, because Freedom Day is cancelled, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'm taking my mask off on June the 21st, because there is no point in wearing it. And I'm taking your mask off, you're taking everything off and strapping on your flamethrower. I am. I am. I, th- I think it might be spanks and a flamethrower because I don't we, do, we we don't want people to be you know to have too much shock at one time. But but so there's this suggestion that people should post their masks to Downing Street to Boris to arrive on June the 21st and just with a little note saying I will not be wearing a mask because. But more seriously, Liam, I'm always very proud of the leaders that we have in the Telegraph. I mean, we have an absolutely top team. The, the leading articles that are basically the voice of the paper. Yeah, and and they're always judicious and, you know, often brilliant and witty and so on. Absolutely. That's because we never write them. Yeah. (laughs) We're not not allowed near them, are we? write them, right? (laughs) Yeah, God knows they wouldn't let us near them. I guess we wouldn't allow us to lower the tone. But the leader column this week talked about this cancellation of Freedom Day. They remember the Daily Telegraph is the beating heart of, of conservative voters. And the leader said that the government portrays this decision as a pragmatic postponement, not a cancellation, and that one will, that will be of no lasting significance. But it is much more significant than that. It is a betrayal of thousands of companies already driven to the edge of ruin by lockdown and social distancing, who have spent significant sums of money in preparation for a full reopening on June the 21st, Ministers might claim their mantra all along had been data, not dates. However, has anyone in government bothered to calculate how many companies will be bankrupted by weeks of extra restrictions? It is a betrayal of the public, many of whom have only been able to endure the past few months because of the firm knowledge that an end was in sight. They have embraced vaccination, believing that it would be used to reopen. Instead, they find themselves under tighter restrictions than this time last year when there was no jab. Above all, it is a betrayal of conservative principles. Freedom is being treated not as the inalienable right of every individual to be curtailed only in the most extreme of emergencies, but as conditional to be disregarded whenever it is convenient to the government. Take that. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, but my pals call me Chopper. And you can too. Just dropping into my second favourite podcast to tell you about another Telegraph show. Mine! As a Telegraph's chief political correspondent, I spend my days holding politicians to account and asking them about the things that affect you. I speak to the top politicians from across the political spectrum, commentators with their finger on the pulse, and of course, my talented colleagues at the Telegraph. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please search Chopper's Politics wherever you're listening to this. Cheerio! Last week, Planet Normal heard from Dr. J. Bhattacharya, based at Stanford University, one of the world's leading epidemiologists. 
Dr. Bhattacharya argued that lockdowns probably killed more people than it saved, and that jabbing people and young adults across the Western world, while vulnerable elderly adults across his native India and other developing countries go unvaccinated, is immoral. Now, as you just heard, Alison's on fire, or at least others near her soon will be, and others are fuming too at Boris Johnson's decision to delay Freedom Day on the 21st of June. This week, we talked to former cabinet minister and one-time conservative leader, Ian Duncan Smith. Now, IDS remains an eloquent and influential MP, popular with many voters for his work on social issues and his honestly held views. I started by asking him what he thought of the Prime Minister's big decision to delay Freedom Day. Uh, well, I don't think I was probably surprised. You know, if there's been anything consistent in this, it's been the consistent pessimism of uh, the scientists that the BBC wants to put on the air. And so, in essence, for the most part, it was obvious what was going on was a kind of concerted attempt to ensure that we didn't unlock on the 21st. Uh, you know, I was sorry, but I, as I say, I wasn't surprised. But I'm sorry because I do think that we could unlock now and we should unlock now. Even if we had one or two sort of more uh, careful restrictions, maybe a, a longer period before nightclubs get going, that sort of thing. But, but generally getting this country back, going into the office, uh, back at work, uh, you know, it was just so important for us economically, um, for people's well-being, mental well-being. COVID has become this, it's like this invader uh, that has taken you over and, uh, you know, sticking their jackboot down on your head saying, what I can do to you is going to be terrible unless you do as you're told. Uh, and that is a kind of sense about where this disease is. I think it's irrational now. And I think the problem is that the attempt to get everyone to do as they're told has led to this fear factor in the back of everyone's heads. I mean, in what world would you think that the BBC would report death rates of eight every day? Why would you report those death rates when they are less than pneumonia by a long way, cancer, heart disease, you name it, it's fifth in the death rate list, or six, I think, uh, uh, of all the other things that are going on. And even hospitalizations. Now, you know, all of this has happened. So we're reaching the stage where I think government's finding it very difficult to take a bold decision. And now the government feels, oh, if we do this and it does go wrong, if, my goodness, won't everybody turn on us and say it was all your fault because you didn't listen to the scientists. That's where I think they are. You've sat in the cabinet, Ian. You've seen power at the highest level. You say the Prime Minister is acting irrationally now. Do you think he's actually clocked the fact that, yes, cases are up. We're doing an, about 700,000 tests a day. No wonder the number of cases have gone up. And the hospitalizations are, are, are overwhelmingly now among younger people rather than older people. Does Boris get all that? Does he get all that, do you think? I am certain he does, and I certain his heart lies in the right place. I think, like everything else, it comes down to who wants to be blamed? Who's going to take the risk? And I think this is the big problem. And I think in government, of course, there are divisions. There are some who still say, oh, no, 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 no. We must be prepared to take no risks on this. Uh, and so what we've got here is with a plan that dare not speak its name from the scientists, which is a zero COVID risk plan, and the other plan for the rest of the UK, which is live with risk. Uh, we've, we've been losing the live with risk, and people have been sliding towards the zero COVID, which enables huge extra powers to be granted to government. And in some ways that suits people, I don't know. But my general sense is that we are now in a fight, not over COVID, but over the, the nature of how we live our lives. And, you know, as I said some the other day, just imagine, you know, we don't think twice. We occasionally uh, or quite often cross the road when there's no zebra crossing or we don't walk to it. We take a bigger risk by doing that and people get knocked down doing that. Uh, we know it's risky, but we do it. We take that balance of risk. We don't, uh, we don't put barriers up along the road, only allowing an exit point at the zebra crossing. 
because that would be uh, too much. That would be to get the balance of risk wrong. People ride motorcycles. They take a risk. They know that uh, riding a motorbike is more dangerous than riding a car, but they balance that with what it brings them. And the same goes for smoking. You know, we know smoking is dangerous. We know it harms your health. We know that you are more likely, therefore, if you smoke, to die of heart and lung disease. But people still take that choice. We don't, you're saying politicians... We don't ban it. We don't ban it, but you're saying that politicians, some politicians, those in charge of our lives at the moment, are, are involved in some kind of power grab here. No, I think what's happening is, over the last year, is that people have got used to the idea that we are in a war, fighting a war against COVID. And so therefore the powers that government has to itself are only reasonable and, and people must do as they're told and people are not allowed to take a risk. And if you take a risk, notice you are told that this is selfish. You are being selfish now if you take a risk. Ian, you haven't always agreed with Theresa May in the past, have you? But the former prime minister... She's been making some pretty strong speeches in the Commons about lockdown, hasn't she? And she's as, just as critical as you are. Yes, Theresa, um, for both of us, in a way, there's a slight problem about this. One is because Theresa was prime minister and therefore it's, you know, prime ministers should avoid, if they're possible, criticising their successors. Although that doesn't always run because Mrs Thatcher certainly wasn't uh, <laughs> uh, reticent about criticising John Major. Nor like. Ted Heath before Mrs Thatcher. <laughs> no, no. So, so that's been observed more in the failure than in the success. But, but uh, Theresa definitely now is concerned about this decision making. But I think she's moved across from being concerned now to being very worried. And I'm in that place as well. In fact, I've, I supported the government in the last lockdown. I wasn't... I was uneasy about it, but I thought if, if his general point is we're buying time to get to, uh, to vaccine uh, stability, I therefore thought, right, when we've got there, and I volunteered in my local vaccination centre and you know, helped everybody there because I thought this is great, 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 we get to Freedom Day. Um, and, and like everybody else, all that hard work and everything else, I'm disappointed, and I'm disappointed as Theresa is. So, so uh, Theresa is right. I... I we don't always agree with each other, but I think on this we do. Do you think it's possible, probable, that lockdown, given the massive NHS waiting lists, given the mental health issues, given the depression, given the family breakup, given the impact of economic nosedives on lives, could lockdown have killed more people than it saved? Well, this is what, when we finally look at this, I don't want a narrow report to look at, you know, why didn't we lock down then and why did we? I want a wider report to look at was lockdown successful? I want us to ask the question, is lockdown a reasonable thing to do? Or is it at the end on balance of what we lost as to what we might have gained uh, wrong? And should we ever do it again? And this, I think, is the big question. We stumbled into lockdown, it seemed to me, because other countries started to do it. Um, now, the big problem we've got, as we've gone into one smaller lockdown, then a third lockdown, um, is that we're getting into the habit of this now as a way of resolving it. So now what I have is a real problem, why this review needs to look carefully at were lockdowns and are lockdowns a policy uh, instrument or should they be abandoned? And that's because where do we go now each year? If in the psyche of all the, all the health people and the scientists is that every time we get to a certain point of a disease, we must lock down to stop it spreading. In 1968, we had 85 to 90,000 people died of a flu virus. Actually, they were young people, not old people, as with COVID. Um, we didn't lock down then. But if that was to repeat itself in the winter, if we had... I don't know, uh, a, a serious flu virus, would we lock down or would we do what we've always done, get on with it uh, and just say, well, that's, that's where it is and try and give the vaccines to the elderly. So my question really is, where is, if this is in our mind now, will we ever stop? Every winter now will the case be made for a lockdown? Two weeks, three You think weeks, that's a danger? Weeks. Do you think yes. that's... I think genuinely a danger. You think that could happen, yes. Ian, in our country? I do think it could happen because I think it's it's in the mindset now of uh, of scientists and of politicians that it is a legitimate tool of policy, and I am really worried about that because it's 
A, about freedoms, but B, it's about the economy, and C, it's about people's well-being. And it's a very, it's a very heavy hammer to aim at a very small nail. And the trouble is the collateral damage is vast, and that needs to be calculated in the overall sum of did we take the right decisions. Moving on, you mentioned other countries there. Sir Richard Dearlove's appeared on Planet Normal twice over the last year, most recently repeating his assertion this coronavirus was created in a lab and then inadvertently escaped. The difference is now that a lot of the rest of the world believes him. They didn't believe him a year ago. The WHO says that scenario is feasible. You've been banned from going to China now for speaking out about the role of Beijing covering up this coronavirus. What did you feel when you heard Sir Richard's latest intervention? Well, it was it, it, it told me something else. The first thing it told me was that we've now reached the stage where powerful companies uh, basically edit what we do and sanction us. So not just government says not right, but you get the Googles and the Facebooks, or really the Facebooks certainly, are deciding that uh, they have to check you out if they don't agree with what you say. So uh, anybody who mentioned Wuhan for a long period uh, was deemed to be uh, fear-mongering and was shut down. Uh, and this percolated through to all the usual suspects in the intelligentsia here in the UK and in America and abroad, so that they used to laugh at, oh, this is all nonsense, there's no evidence. Uh, but it's becoming now clear that um, it had to have been almost certainly, but we wait for, if we ever get the evidence, have come from the laboratory, mostly because there are now changes in the secret DNA sequencing inside this virus which look deeply suspicious, and uh, as though they didn't form naturally, but they have been altered. So I think there is great credence now in the strong possibility, even probability, that something went wrong in the lab in Wuhan and that as a result of that it spread and because of the changes to it, it spread far more easily and with greater effect. And this, I think, is the key problem. But the number one problem, though, isn't, I mean, I think the lab is a real issue for China. But the second issue, which I think is even bigger for China, is their desire to hide this from the whole world for a period. They knew about human to human transfer in December probably late November, but certainly... This is late December 2019, early, early well, January late, 2020. In early December, it's almost certain now that they knew about human-to-human -human transfer. After all, by mid-December, they were, they were silencing scientists who were raising questions about, and doctors, about the nature of this infection. And when, uh, when their time came to tell the WHO, they didn't. Uh, they delayed that uh, until uh, January, when in mid-January, they finally told the WHO they had an epidemic, by which time it was too late. It had already traveled uh, with people traveling, particularly to Italy, but uh, across the world, uh, into the United States. Everywhere there were people going from China and into China, picking it up, spreading it on. And the result is we've had a global pandemic, which they admitted to, I think, on or around the 20th of January, finally, that it was out of control. And the WHO failed because they didn't interrogate it. Uh, and between the two of them, but particularly in China's case, we are now suffering all because of China's complete arrogant failure to stand up for what they were supposed to have done, and instead of which, hide this in the hope that they could silence it or stop it before anyone really noticed. That was a disaster, and we've all paid for that disaster. What could this disaster, as you rightly call it, do in terms of geopolitics, in terms of China's relations with particularly the Western world? Could we enter a new Sino-Western Cold War? Well, I think what this first of all does, as I've been arguing for long before COVID, but that China is a growing threat to the West. They are an ideological threat because they do not believe that democracy is here to stay. And they have made it very clear, President Xi couldn't be clearer, that he thinks the Chinese form of government is the right model. It's the more ancient one and the right one. And he thinks democracy is a flash in the pan 
uh, you know, over the last couple of hundred years, and he thinks it will be driven out by their model. So straight away, we have an ideological opponent. The second thing is we, this ideological opponent has, however, been made incredibly wealthy by uh, Western companies and governments flying to them to get, first of all, cheaper products and eventually cheaper technology, and finally, to get investment back from China. So they now have a position that the Soviet Union could only have marveled at if they had seen it, which is an ideological difference, a massive economy that feeds that capability with a growing military which they believe will outpace the United States by about 2049. This makes them, I think, a big threat. So you think China's a bigger threat than the Soviet Union was at the height of its power? I think it will, it will be bigger uh, over the next decade and a half. Uh, I think the difference, as I said, is that the Soviet Union was a threat for a period of time, but it was a threat on an economy the size of a peanut. This is a growing threat on the size of an economy which will soon apparently outreach the United States. That, if you remember, one of the reasons we defeated the Soviet Union was economic. That, in other words, we made it so expensive for the Soviet Union to compete that it crashed their economy. This isn't going to happen to China. China is now in a very strong position. And the thing about COVID is it shines a light onto China and you begin to see actually what kind of government China is. And you see how aggressive and dictatorial and brutal it is. I mean, the Uyghurs, you know, forced, you know, slave labor camps, forced sterilization, incarceration, you know, uh, children separated and brought into schools to in, in, in inculcate uh, Mandarin, not their own language at all, ethnicity being driven out, Tibet's the same. You look at the Christians and the Falun Gongs persecuted, Falun Gong organ harvesting, Hong Kong treaty trashed, democracy being crushed, people being locked up for peaceful protests, uh, which was allowed for in the original Sino-British agreement, aggression on their borders, soldiers, Indian soldiers killed on border clashes, South China seas occupied against the rules and laws by the UN, but occupied by China. You know, you go on round everywhere you go. Taiwan, permanently threatened now, overflown by, uh, by Chinese jets on a daily basis. We have a power growing and not a friendly one. And yet Western governments still hesitate because they don't want to upset China because they're desperate for Chinese investment and Chinese business. This is really why the danger is much greater. We were never in that position with the Soviet Union. We are in that now with China, where they have a grip on us economically and they have a burgeoning military which will have a grip on us militarily and territorially. And this is ideologically dangerous for us because I think the Western world, the free, the free world, the democracies are under real threat. The G7 was an opportunity to restate their position and start to withdraw their investments uh, and their business links with China, but they kind of hesitated. Europe wasn't very keen. Uh, Britain still is caught between America and Europe on this. Uh, the Americans are now beginning to wake up to it. At least they are now beginning to forge a new policy with China. But I think that the UK should, having left the European Union, work closely with America uh, uh, to develop the defences that we have, business, economic and military, against what I think is this desperate threat. Ian Duncan Smith, thanks so much for joining us on Planet Normal. Gosh, what an amazing interview, Liam. I mean, Ian Gunn Duncan Smith comes across so well, doesn't he? I mean, I was so dismayed watching the G7 coverage to see Dominic Raab, our foreign secretary, say about China that the UK believes that the virus, the COVID virus, came from animals and was not man-made. I mean, that's our foreign secretary, Liam. And, and I think if we're going to take that timid position for shame, for shame on us, really. And how great that we've got someone with real integrity and moral breadth of Ian Duncan Smith, who, you know, is addressing all these issues. And wasn't he fascinating about the kind of power dynamic between the scientists and the politicians that's going on over the sort of restrictions. He talked about the consistent pessimism of scientists who have got a sort of secret zero COVID plot. Are these restrictions going to become a feature of how we live our lives? I don't know how you feel, Liam, but I would consider moving abroad if this is the kind of regime we're going to have to live under. And then talking about also the idea that 
politicians have got used to the idea that we're in a war against COVID, even though the enemy is on its last legs. We know it is, but they think these powers are reasonable and that anyone who takes a risk is the bad person. And we, you and I both think, don't we, that now taking a risk is makes you the good person. Well, I first met IDS back in the mid-90s when he'd only been in Parliament a, a few years and I was a young political reporter and... I've always found him as somebody who's very, very thoughtful and does a lot of research and knows a lot of stuff. And yet I feel he, he's, he's often sort of dismissed too easily, too lightly by other people in the Conservative Party. And, you know, he seemed to be, have been an unsuccessful leader. But, you know, it was a pretty difficult wicket back in the early 2000s when New Labour were at the height of their power. And I think he demonstrated a lot of qualities in that interview backing Sir Richard Dearlove's point of view on COVID and the Wuhan lab theory, it strikes me that, you know, there is clearly a huge rift now between big parts of the intelligence community on the one hand that Dearlove is sticking up for and the Foreign Office that has always been, you know, very but much in sort of the George Osborne mould of this is the new golden age of China, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that was expressed by Dominic Raab as the G, at the G7, as you said, and IDS feels this China issue strongly, given that he's actually been banned now by oh. Beijing from, from traveling in the People's Republic. It's starting to get really, really quite serious. And when people like him say that relations between China and the West could become as dangerous as they were, or even more so than they were between the Soviet Union and the Western world, the kind of Cold War atmosphere that you and I grew up in, then that's worth considering. But I think the immediate comments he made about Boris Johnson's actions are in some ways even more explosive because this is a guy who's often in the room when big decisions are made. And he's talking about, you know, colleagues he's worked with for, you know, half his life and people he respects. And this guy is not an outsider. You know, the, just just this week, I was meant to talk to him in the interview and we didn't even get round to it about a report that he's just done for Boris Johnson, commissioned by Boris Johnson, along with the mid-Norfolk MP, George Freeman, into how to make a success of Brexit in, uh, from a sort of technical, regulatory and legal nitty-gritty point of view. So this is somebody who clearly is part of the Prime Minister's circle, even if he's not you know, one of his most trusted confidants. And for him to say what he said about the Prime Minister's actions, how he's become irrational uh, about lockdown, how he needs to push the scientists down to one side and make a bigger, bolder decision, I think, is pretty eye-catching. Yes, I, I think actually just about as you were about to interview him, I think he'd actually been in with the Prime Minister, so so he's that close. I think, Liam, we're getting a bit sick of hearing people say, oh, Boris's heart lies in the right place, you know. If they're trying to play this avoid the blame game, while, well, you know, very, very serious things are going on in this country. And if it's kind of past the parcel and no one, you know, no one wants to be left holding the bomb, you know, I just think it's timid, really. I mean, there were two interesting pieces of news this week, something that would gladden the heart of Planet Normal. I don't know if you saw that the JCVI, that's the Joint Committee on Vaccination Immunisation, is to recommend against the vaccination of under 18s until there is more safety data. That's something you've campaigned on strongly in your writing and on Planet Normal. Well, we had wonderful Dr. Ros Jones on, who's a very experienced paediatrician, and she felt very, very passionately. She's extremely pro-vaccination. She's been in Africa vaccinating children, but she was very, very worried about giving a COVID vaccination to children who don't suffer from the disease. And I was relieved, Liam, I actually had a few tears in my eyes when I read that. And I think it's because I was so worried that if the JCVI had slightly washed its hands and just given the politicians a range of options, I've reached the point where I don't trust our politicians to make wise ethical decisions for the population. And I could just see someone like Matt Hancock in that kind of mad messianic way saying, yeah, let's jab the kids and make us all safe. And I didn't think it would be safe for children um, until it's proven otherwise. So I was hugely relieved. And 
We've also got this very contentious thing just breaking now, haven't we, Liam, about that the COVID vaccine needs to be compulsory for England care home staff. Workers are expected to be given six weeks to have the jab or to face losing their jobs. Now, this is an ethical minefield, isn't it? I mean, what's your take? It certainly is. I, I mean, I'm really glad that the compulsory vaccination of children has been shelved, hopefully canned forever. Um, and well done to you for highlighting that with such force. But I do think that in the end, if you want to work in a care home or a hospital, you should be vaccinated. And I say that with a heavy heart after a lot of thought. But in the end, people working in care homes or as healthcare workers can get alternative employment. So it's not, you're not condemning them to not being able to go to work. They can get alternative employment and maybe there so can be compensation in some cases. But it does strike me as pretty mad if you've got very, very vulnerable older people being exposed to at close quarters by definition in, in a tactile way, <laughs> again, by definition, people who aren't having the vaccine when the whole of the rest of the country is working so hard to get this vaccine into people's arms. I think that is one limited case in which compulsory vaccination would be morally justifiable in my view. I think there are practical problems though, because we have staff shortages in care homes and a lot. I mean, I worked many, many years ago when I was a student, Halleck, and I worked on a, in a mental hospital, actually. It was a, a pre-senile dementia ward and lots of the care staff are from the Philippines and from South Asian backgrounds. And these are the people who are most suspicious of the vaccine so I foresee some quite volatile exchanges in the weeks ahead, days and weeks ahead, because if the majority or many of the care home staff come from populations who are vaccine averse, and maybe, let's face the brutal truth, uh, Liam, this may be what's lying in the government's mind, may, may it not, that we've there's they've been very cagey about where the infections are. But I think looking at the map, we know very clearly where the Indian variant is and is spreading and where the hospitals, George tells me, the hospitals which are most affected. And they are in areas where uh, communities are most suspicious of the vaccine. So I think we're going to see um, a lot of clashes and possibly some human rights arguments brought out about whether not believing in the vaccine could become cited as a sort of ethical belief that you're allowed to assert it. And indeed, as we know, after the Second World War, there is the Nuremberg Convention, which means that no one has to have anything put into their bodies that they don't want. So sparky times ahead. Now it's time for our list of emails, a selection of the fantastic, insightful, often funny and variably heartbreaking messages you send each week to Liam and me at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. We've had an absolutely bumper crop this week. We just can't get through them all and they are absolutely wonderful. This is from Caroline. Our family has nearly completed the COVID bingo card. Mum dying alone in care home. COVID, self-isolation, furlough, working from home, foreign holidays cancelled, funeral for four, funeral for 30, no wake, sister unable to fly from the US despite being fully vaccinated, sister-in-law ripped off by inept testing company when she flew into quarantine with my terminally ill father-in-law and phoned repeatedly by track and trace and made to feel like a pariah for wanting to see your own sick father band practice cancelled, events industry shut down, don't see your girlfriend who lives two miles away for three months, Euro 2020 tickets cancelled. Every time it looks as though you have a full house in COVID bingo, someone, aka Sage or Professor Lockdown, adds another scary to the line. Yesterday, we hoped to complete the card when my 25-year-old had his Pfizer vaccine along with thousands of others, queuing with as much excitement as getting Glastonbury tickets. Let us use the ingenuity that we have used to get everyone vaccinated to restart foreign holidays, reunite much-loved relatives and get the music, events, hospitality and aviation industry back on their feet. 
Not doing so risks accelerating a mental health crisis. My sons in their 20s have kept their grandparents safe. Let's give them a chance now to get their lives back on track as soon as possible. We often save Planet Normal for our regular trips from the Midlands to Yorkshire to visit my father. Thank you for keeping us sane. We wish we could listen to you every morning instead of the dreaded lockdown zealots on the Today programme. Best wishes and thank you both for letting us know that we are not alone. Oh, that's a fantastic email, Caroline. I really love the idea of COVID bingo. Liam, have you got something for us? I have indeed. That was a wonderful one. And this is also wonderful from Lindsay. Are you still out there, Planet Normal? Is common sense now extinct? Like the dinosaurs, will this concept ever roam the planet again? I find myself compelled to ask as I'm utterly baffled by the UK's announcement they'll be delaying Freedom Day. On what grounds? I hear cries from the people on the streets across the UK so loud are their cries, I hear them in New York. As an expat living in the US, I've watched the UK remain in lockdown far longer and stricter than that of the majority of states in America. In fact, today, New York lifted all COVID restrictions. Yet the UK, which has been a leader administering the vaccine, a program rivaled by so few, are locking down for longer still. With COVID patients amounting to less than 1% of NHS hospital beds and over 50% of the UK population having received at least one vaccine dose. What is the risk the government and their advisors are so terrified of? of allowing people to choose their own comfort levels with a now somewhat informed perspective on this virus? Is it the risk of children hugging and playing in the playground and families being reunited? The risk that our economy opens and thrives? The risk that we all move on with our lives? Or is it the risk that the government and members of parliament may have to give up the unforeseen power they now wield over our society? I've listened each week from afar for my dose of Planet Normal. The thoughts and stories of your guests and listeners have been pragmatic, powerful, poignant. On many occasions, they've brought tears to my eyes as I've heard harrowing and heartbreaking tales of the consequences of this pandemic. It's kept me from my family in Scotland for 18 months and more. Like so many expats, I've never felt so far away. I've missed the birth of my first nephew. My parents have missed out on half of my children's lives. I've been married without a father to walk me down an aisle or a mother to help pick my dress. I've lost a job. I felt sad, guilty, angry, overwhelmed and exhausted. We all, whoever we are, have a story to tell. And for the majority of us, we've remained steadfast to the cause of protecting those more vulnerable than us and understanding the sacrifice for the greater good. That is until this past week, when Mr. Biden and the G7 leaders descended on the UK with their entourage of staffers, and the world's press corps in tow, unhindered by no-fly rules or closed borders, I don't know how anyone in good faith can reconcile a delay of Freedom Day and an in-person G7 summit on UK shores. So I find myself as a mother trying to answer yet another question from my four-year-old son, only this time it's not about dinosaurs or trucks or the largest or fastest or slowest thing. Mummy, why can the President, Mr Biden, go visit England but we can't? I don't know, son. I just don't know. Crikey. Lindsay's not the only person, Liam, who has watched the G7 schmoozing barbecue, violating many of the regulations which we, the peasants, have to abide by. And you might have noticed that the hashtag I'm done was trending on Twitter because a lot of people looked at those people and I looked at them and I thought, are you members of two households? Which is what we're asked when we're trying to organise a get together. I'm not sure that they realised how badly that would come across. Anyway, this is from Eric. Imagine if the public had been told in March 2020 that their lives would be locked down for 18 months and possibly indefinitely after that despite having received a vaccination and on account of a virus accounting for approximately 0.5% of deaths, what would the reaction have been? But today, after the psychological conditioning and relentless focus of fear and amplification of COVID, all of this sounds perfectly rational to a cowed and broken British public. Well done, Boris. What a country you have bequeathed us. What a legacy you will enjoy. And on the same theme, this is from Richard. Dear co-pilots, there are two excellent items in today's Telegraph. One, of course, is the regular column by co-pilot Pearson. 
The other is an article comparing the graphs shown by Chris Whitty at Monday's press conference with other graphs showing what Whitty's graphs concealed. Looking at the comparisons, it is hard not to think that Whitty was being deliberately misleading. Simple sleight of hand techniques were used, selecting a limited time period or using percentages instead of absolute numbers. It raises the question, did Witty and Valance decide in advance that Freedom Day would be postponed and then sit around mulling how best to present the graphics to bamboozle the public? And is our classicist Prime Minister incapable of asking the simplest questions about the data? Keep on flying. This one's from Richard in the same vein. Dear Liam, just after 6pm yesterday, I thought I heard an explosion. Could you confirm this was Alison responding to our pusillanimous Prime Minister's announcement Freedom Day had been cancelled? <laughs> Perhaps on a more serious note, I make the following comment. The current attitude of many to the risks associated with COVID-19 fail to appreciate that the only way of avoiding all risk is never to be conceived in the first place. From the moment of conception, risk enters your life. Tragically, Some babies never reach full term. Others are stillborn. Some are born with life-limiting conditions or contract fatal illnesses. All this could be avoided by simply prohibiting procreation. So why don't we do so? The answer is we have a sense of proportion. For the moment, it's so sadly lacking when it comes to COVID-19 and how we are dealing with it. Thanks so much for Planet Normal. Yours, Richard. So that's it for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason our flying refuge of reason views email of the week Alison Liam I think we should give the email of the week to Lindsay who sent that absolutely wonderful spine tingling email to us from New York Lindsay from New York I think this is possibly is this our first planet normal mug that's going abroad anyway Lindsay we're delighted to send you a mug for that Liam and I will be responding as normal to your comments on the Telegraph website on Thursday morning, the day that this podcast is released between 11am and 12 noon. I promise to have calmed down a bit by then. We'll put the link to that article in the description notes of this episode or just go to telegraph.co.uk and look for the article labelled Planet Normal. So as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal, the madness of planet Earth comes back into view. Thanks as ever to our producers, Louisa Wells, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampitt, and our editor, Theodora Leloudis. Stay safe and in touch with each other and with us. And until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs>